Well, anyway, hi to those uh, I know, you know, Sanjoy and Billy and Grasshopper and some of the others. It's uh, good to talk to you, although I can't see what you look like. <laughs> For those of you who don't know me, my name is John Barris. I'm a professor in oceanography and in the astrobiology program at the University of Washington. And I, my research emphasis has been uh, life in extreme environments, and particularly on volcanic environments, such as submarine hydrothermal vents. But I've also worked in terrestrial systems like at Mount St. Helens. Um, I am a committed astrobiologist and have done a number of things related to astrobiology. Uh, probably the most experience I have is with planetary protection issues, having been on six national and international committees to deal with forward and back contamination of everything from Mars to icy moons, etc. Uh, my background is I have a dual degree in uh, chemistry and microbiology. The chemistry was primarily organic and biochemistry. Did a master's in microbial genetics and a PhD looking at the role of marine viruses in transferring genes. Mm -hmm. And that's it. That's all I'm going to say about myself. Compute the cameras up here, by the way. Um, all right. So, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> all right. So, Sanjoy wants to know how did you become an astrobiologist? <clears throat> Well, it really goes back quite some time. I, I've been interested in uh, life on other planets since I was a kid. And in the 1950s, as a grade school kid, uh, my father bought a telescope and put it on the roof of the house. And I would go up to the roof and we would study as much as we could and hope that a flying saucer would land on our roof. Of course, none of that actually happened, but I have, you know, at 10 years old, that was quite a motivation. I really believed that there was life out there, and, uh, and so I've been interested in it uh, ever since. And even as an undergraduate, in one of the courses I took, I wrote a term paper on uh, what life might actually look like in, in a different planet. But I would say a turning point for me was when I was at University of California at Berkeley as a student and I heard Carl Sagan talk. And this was before the Viking uh, experiment and he said he believed that there was life on Mars not on the surface and deep down and uh, into the subsurface and he said that he expected to see something similar to earthworms in the subsurface of Mars. Well, I mean, I didn't buy into the earthworm thing, but I did get very much involved in subsurface environments, and and I, I think that was a, a played a big role in my choosing to go into the subsurface environment uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, you know, that every all of them from uh, it's a, sort of an unknown biosphere to the point that maybe the life started there, and that in many. Uh, probably planetary bodies, if there is going to be life, it's not going to be on the surface. Other questions? <laughs> uh, Sanjoy says, could you tell us a little bit about what was going on in your mind when you first set eyes on hydrothermal vents and their ecosystems in the 1970s? Okay, what happened is that I started my postdoc at University, Oregon State University, uh, essentially the same time that a group of people at Oregon State University, Stanford, and MIT organized the first hydrothermal vent cruise in 1977. And this was to the Galapagos Ridge. And the way that was, the motivation there was that some temperature anomalies had been measured in the water column off of, of uh, the Galapagos. And even though they were a fraction of a degree, that indicated there was a serious source of heat coming from somewhere. So this first cruise were, were all geologists and geochemists and geophysicists, okay, or no biologists. I'm giving you a little bit of background. And uh, 
Well, of course, you know, they made their first dives, and, and what came across was incredible life and all sorts of really interesting things. And that's how I really got started in it, because uh, the chief scientist, Jack Corliss, uh, called back to Oregon State to get some information on what to do with the animals. And so I had suggested, knowing a number of the people on board, that there would be a lot of tequila, rum, and high alcohol vanilla on board uh, from Mexico. And so I said, you know, to preserve the samples in, in those precious fluids, and including get some water samples for me to actually do some counts on and, and uh, preserve them in tequila. So that's how I first really got involved. I made the first counts, actually, uh, from diffuse flow vents at, at uh, the Galapagos and found that there were quite a few bacteria. But what really turned me on were two other things. One is, at that time also, uh, Thomas Brock was working in Yellowstone and finding organisms that can grow at 90 degrees Celsius and also organisms that grow at pH zero and at high temperature. And so I got really interested in that. And he, he wrote a book in that time frame on his experiences. And one of the things he said is perhaps that uh, life is really basically limited by where there is liquid water. Okay, in 1978, uh, Fred Spies at Scripps had discovered black smokers. And there at 2,500 meters, you actually have, were having liquid water that was well above 100 degrees. And in fact, it can, seawater can, uh, won't boil until it's over 400 degrees Celsius. So here was a an instance where you had some really high temperature liquid water. So the first cruise to go sample those was a couple of years later. And uh, I actually finagled myself on that cruise as the only biologist, much to the chagrin of the chief scientist. Uh, and <clears throat> the idea was to get some hot water and see if there was anything in it. And I worked with a another postdoc at the time, Russ McDuff, who's a faculty member here, and he was a postdoc with the chief scientist at MIT, and he and I had worked out a deal that if he said pink flamingo, that meant he had actually taken a hot water sample without the chief scientist knowing it, and then we could, he could send it off to me. So that's how I really got involved in, in that, but I was really interested in what, you know, uh, high temperature life in particular on that, on that early, uh, on those early cruises. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to sit here and snicker in the background. Um, <laughs> while you guys are thinking of extra questions, I'm actually going to ask John to talk about something because I know a few things that he should talk about. Um, and one of them is you were one of the first people to suggest that um, life may have begun at hydrothermal vents. And so I was wondering if you could give them a little bit of insight into why that might be a good site for the origin of life and how you first came up with that idea. Again, I was essentially postdocing, and <clears throat> there was a, a graduate student, uh, Sarah Hoffman, and she was a graduate student of Jack Corliss, also in, in the geosciences. And we started having a discussion on the origin of life, and as a geologist, she was investigating uh, the early terrain where we actually have found life and, and saw that there might be actually some parallels between those early terrains at three, five to three, eight billion years ago to hydrothermal systems. And so she wrote a, a term paper and a course and the faculty member there said, wow, this is really cool. You need to develop this. And so she and I spent the better part of a year developing that paper uh, and my putting in a lot of the organic chemistry. And, and so we put out the first paper on uh, the, the possibility that life started in, in uh, hydrothermal vents. The first author was Jack Corliss, who was Sarah Hoffman's major professor. And I won't say any more about that. The, I think that the result of that 
paper, uh, I started a Origin of Life group at Oregon State as a postdoc that we would meet every other Thursday at my house. And there was a number of faculty and graduate students and that that we would sit and talk about papers, etc. And that allowed us to develop that concept a little bit more and uh, resulted in the paper, the, the Barris and Hoffman paper later on, uh, dealing more specifically with hydrothermal systems. So that's basically how I, I got into it. It was just uh, the discovery of the events and uh, I, must, I must also point out too that this was a pretty interesting time. It just dawned on me now that the very first uh, work coming out of Carl Woese's lab dealing with the separation of the three domains was coming out in that time frame. And in that early, when we wrote the first Origin of Life paper, we cited the paper by George Fox indicating that the archaea were separate from bacteria uh, and essentially say, you know, having the three domains. And we used that to indicate that perhaps these archaea, the ones that we knew about, and particularly those that could that grew without oxygen and some even at high temperature, may, may actually be uh, some of the earliest organisms on Earth. And so we built that into our early papers also. So there's a lot of things, the discovery of the vents, the discovery of smokers, uh, Sarah Hoffman's seeing a, 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 a geological relationship between vents and where we have evidence of early life. And then I think the Carl Woese uh, ribosomal RNA work that, that pointed out uh, uh, archaea and extremophiles as being ancient. I think all of those converge to help develop that paper. All right, so we have a couple questions in here. I do want to point out, first of all, that Billy thanked you for making it so in early, into the office so early. It's 11 here, Billy's not that, that early. Actually, Billy, if you're still <laughs> online, I actually had a 9 a.m. Cl class to teach in Dave Catling's thing, so I was at upper campus at 8.30 this morning, okay? <laughs> so he's, he's a little grumpy. <clears throat> anyway, just kidding. Um, and Justin Barker says, wouldn't they get suspicious that you were talking about pink flamingos for no reason? And Billy says, oh, dear God. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> Johnny Bontemp. Bontemp wants to know, what's one of the most interesting, bizarre life forms you've ever encountered in these environments? My favorite that I lost was what I called the, uh, the house bug. And I don't know if all, uh, maybe, I don't know if you've heard this. No. I went to Yellowstone once with a group of biotech people from uh, Diversa, uh, Eric Mather, and we flew into... Uh, that part of the world and we got horses and went into sampling some of the sites that normally haven't been sampled and there was a mud volcano at about 70 something degrees or something that I had isolated an organism that looked it was a very straight thin rod it looked like what, what I would call a, a, a mixobacteria, except it was growing at 70, 75 degrees. And it was growing in single carbon substrates with sulfur. And as I was looking at it under the microscope over time, as the culture was aging, these sticks would then come together and form plates. So there would be four sticks making a square and then sticks would fill out that square and there would be this plate and there would be multiple plates and then the plates started coming together and building structures and the next thing I knew I had towers being formed by these microbes. The okay. problem is is that I couldn't keep the culture going uh, unfortunately but that is the, the most incredible group of organisms I've ever had a chance to see. Okay. So that's still out there to be isolated by somebody. In a mud volcano at Yellowstone? It was in a mud volcano and it's an unbelievable structure that the, these organisms produced. Huh. I was just there. If I'd known, I would have sampled yeah. one of those mud volcanoes. Um, Michael Bush wants to know, going on a tangent from the hydrothermal vents, can you talk about how discoveries of life in hydrothermal systems and other extreme environments changed ideas about planetary protection? Boy, that's a complex question uh, because obviously uh, 
the fact that the only things that limit where microbes grow is the presence of liquid water and temperature pretty much. So we now know organisms can withstand radiation levels uh, far greater than is found naturally on, on Earth. Uh, there is no pH limit pretty much to organisms. Um, they grow in supersaturated salts, etc. So the, the bottom line is what, what uh, organisms that can grow at the most extreme conditions have really made it difficult to pass anything through planetary protection, particularly uh, on bringing a, a live sample back. It's been a really difficult task. And so I have been pushing the concept that particularly most of the uh, environments that I think that we might want to sample, such as in sample in Enceladus and uh, probably also in uh, Europa and probably Mars, are, are anaerobic systems. There's no oxygen. And so I've been myself pushing the idea that exposure to oxygen would be all that would be necessary to inactivate the organism at the same time preserving the biochemistry of organisms if they were present. Now I haven't passed that through. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't been able to get the people involved in planetary protection to buy into that yet. They've asked me now to write a paper on it. So that is my next project is writing a paper on it. That's become complicated because I have found uh, anaerobic microorganisms that have found ways to tolerate oxygen, uh, in some cases low levels, in other cases higher levels, but looking at the genetic systems of those, they've been acquired by organisms that have adapted to oxygen. So I have to build on that. So that, that's, there is, a, there is a, a, a really touchy issue with planetary protection, and I can point out that I've been part of a what is called a life project to bring a sample back from Enceladus and I'm part of that team and it's just been it's going to be horrendous to get planetary protection and, and Coast Bar people to actually approve sample return without completely nuking the hell out of it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> stop being snarky in the background. <laughs> Um, Sanjoy wants to know, um, actually, you know what, let's go down to this one because, um, you were answering this question earlier about the mud volcano organisms. He wanted to know, have the genomes of any of these organisms been examined? Are the genomes substantially different from other bacteria in any way? But you guys haven't isolated them, right? Uh, the one from Yellowstone, no, we, we haven't isolated, but certainly, uh, the organisms from hydrothermal vents have proven to be quite diverse. And you know their their genomes uh, in many cases are very different from anything we'd seen prior to that. And I always like to make the point, for example, that uh, there are now six known pathways for carbon dioxide fixation in the microbial world. All are found in hydrothermal vents. Uh, some only in hydrothermal vent microorganisms. And I know of at least one other organism from the vents that fix CO2 in, in which the pathway is not known. So that is uh, something that we, we have you know, learned not just only from the genomes, but from uh, in, uh, you know, isolating and studying them. Uh, another, I think, huge breakthrough has been in the ability of microorganisms to oxidize compounds in the absence of oxygen, uh, for example, methane. And back in the 90s when this was first discovered, it was found that two organisms had to be involved, one that oxidized methane and another one that uh, reduced sulfate with the protons produced from that anaerobic oxidation of methane. Now there's, I think, five mechanisms for anaerobic oxidation of methane. And my, my point here being that uh, there is so much to learn, not only from what we get out of the genome, but particularly from uh, you know, isolating the organisms or applying some of the newer uh, in situ techniques that allow us to, uh, to see what organisms are doing what in conjunction with other organisms. So I, I think that's where 
the move is. We're just tapping into the surface of what's out there, believe me, just tapping into the surface. All right, um, let's see, Sanjoy says, could you describe a little bit what it's like to dive in the Alvin submarine, in particular what one feels? <laughs> well, you know, I've had, I don't know, 30 something dives or whatever, I can't remember. Uh, the first one was totally uneventful uh, because uh, the pilot was uh, untrained and we did not land in the vents. We looked at mud for a few hours. But when I have been in the vents, I really do get this sense that I'm back in time. I really do. And I, I've explained this many times to others that I would be, it's, it's an awesome sight to see a smoker and to see the animals and at the same time to get a sense of, of you know, the er early evolution of these systems and the early evolution of the organisms, both microbes and animals that are associated with that. And as I said, I would not have ever been surprised to see a tribe of trilobites walking, you know, outside the window of the, uh, of the Alvin. So it, it's an awesome sight, provided you don't have to pee. You know, that's the only uh, drawback is, uh, having a biological function on board. <clears throat> We're not going to go into that. No. <clears throat> um, let's see. There was another one. Oh, Sandra wanted to know, did you meet Carl Sagan? Carl Wose, do you have any funny stories? Uh, I met Carl Sagan, and I actually have uh, even a letter somewhere from Carl Sagan. Um, uh, he answered a question that I actually had concerning a, a lecture that, I, that he gave. Um, but I didn't know him very well. I, I was one of my former students, Mel Summit, had isolated an organism from a new eruption in the ocean. And because it was a subsurface organism, I was hoping to classify it uh, and give it the genus name Saganella, naming it after Carl Sagan. But even though we had the sequences published and they were online, somebody actually isolated the same organism, didn't acknowledge us and called it a different organism. So I was going to have some kind of tribute to Carl Sagan. Carl Woese uh, did not like me, so it was not, uh, there's a lot of things he didn't like about the work that I was doing, and so I never met Carl Woese, and Carl Woese, many people haven't met him. He was a uh, fairly cloistered man, he didn't go to meetings, and uh, so no, I never met Carl. I had a great admiration for what he's done and uh, etc. But I never met him. All right. Uh, let's see here. Billy, hi Billy. Um, he says you've witnessed the development of astrobiology from the start. What are your thoughts about the present and future? Did you expect it to be what it is now when you first got involved? That's what I was going to ask. Good question. Well, there's two things. One, as as you know, Billy, and uh, that and Sanjoy knows and that we started the astrobiology program here at University of Washington before NASA started the program. And <clears throat> when we did that, I remember Woody Sullivan and I talking about it. You know, we were thinking primarily first in terms of maybe having some courses to see if we can attract uh, some students into that field and try to develop it ourselves. And, uh, and you know, as you know, when we, Woody and I set up the first course, a seminar course called Planets and Life, it was supposed to be a graduate seminar course, we had like 80 people show up, including, you know, 12 or 15 faculty members from a variety of different departments. And so there was a tremendous interest, and out of that we wrote the IGERT proposal to support graduate students in astrobiology. And after, I think, a little bit of a rough start trying to organize courses, et cetera, and getting faculty uh, on board that were dedicated to Astro, like Roger Buick and eventually Dave Catling and, and Vicki uh, Vicky Meadows, we've had, I think, a particularly successful program. And I know in talking to a number of people at NASA, the UW program is considered the best in the world at training students. And you could probably see that from the number of our students that have received NASA 
postdoc fellowships. It's pretty awesome. Okay, now UW is an education program. Uh, at the time, I didn't really know what was going to happen nationally. The first time I heard that there was going to be a uh, national program in astrobiology, I was invited to go to Goddard. Uh, this was a couple of years before the program started. And Jerry Soffin was still alive, and he was the one that actually had invited me there. And he, and he, he and told me that he and Carl Sagan had talked about setting up a, the, the NASA Astrobiology Institute. And Carl was gone. Carl was going to be the first director of it. And so I had a discussion with Jerry Soffin, and he wanted to know who would be a good director for that, for the first one. And so we had a long discussion. I won't tell you the results of my discussion with him on that one. But the Institute was eventually formed. Uh, Jerry Soffin passed away, and as you know, Barry Bloomberg was the first. Uh, I think overall astro the astrobiology program has done on a national level has done better than I had anticipated uh, early on uh, primarily because I think it has gained a tremendous amount of enthusiasm from people who are even outside of any of the NAI nodes and I think for me the one of the biggest areas of success for astrobiology is as maybe the best topic in science to introduce to students who may be not interested in science or may be slightly interested in science, but I find that the topic is, is so compelling because it covers so many ideas not just scientific, but philosophical and, and theological, et cetera. And so what's come, out of, what's come out of it that I'm very excited about is things like the Bloomberg Chair that NASA and the Library of Congress have established to bring people in for a year to you know, run symposia and, and write uh, papers, et cetera, on how astrobiology affects uh, social sciences, the humanities, uh, arts, etc. And, and that has, I think, a, a tremendous success, uh, so much so that we moved into the next level called the Bloomberg Dialogues, where, where, where we'll be uh, running a series of, of smaller meetings with people dealing with, the first one will be on science and religion. It's going to be held next March. It'll be podcasted, etc. My point is, is that I think astrobiology is the best science discipline to, I think, enlighten the students in this country and elsewhere about science and its importance in their life. I mean, I, as, as all, any of you know me, I'm very concerned about how scientifically illiterate we are in the United States for a first world country, more or less. And I'm very interested in, in finding some way to, uh, you know, to, to bring science into the lives of people in a way that they can not only understand but get excited about. I've also gave a talk to NASA once on uh, entitled uh, Astrobiology and World Peace. And the reason I, I did that is because I've always received a series of emails from uh, students in countries that we don't have any diplomatic relationships with, for example, Iran and others, wanting to, is there any way I can get, come to your country and learn astrobiology? And so I, I think there's those kind of opportunities uh, that are, are definitely out there. And some of you, you know, obviously Sanjoy is really involved in education. So is Grasshopper and others that are really involved in that out outreach and education, and I have tremendous admiration for all that kind of work. Um, all right. So here we have um, Kamish wants to know, is it possible to date hydrothermal vents? How old are they and how long do they last? That's a good question. Uh, 
smokers are, for example, are usually in, uh, God, I think a thousand years is a long time. Uh, so I think a lot of the, uh, the eruptive sites are, are, are not very uh, old. I think in terms of the uh, you know, hydrothermal systems themselves, they have obviously been going on since uh, you know, the early, early Archean or, or, or before. I mean, they're very, very ancient systems, but individual ones don't uh, really last very long. Uh, but when one dies out, it pops up right next to it. So they're pretty, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty versatile in that, in that way. Uh, there's also been a number of studies now, particularly on the East Pacific rise of uh, environments that have been newly erupting environments and able to follow them after the, the eruption and follow them, uh, follow the kinds of animal larvae that come in, etc. And so, for example, when Yellowstone was discovered in, in that, that site, those sites, there were several sites in 19... 77. Most of those sites now have died out, uh, so it, it doesn't take very long to clog them up and then pop up somewhere else. But they're they're continuous in one sense, but the specific ones are are short lived. And Julia, you may remember, um, says, "What's the most dangerous experience you've encountered in the field or on a dive?" <laughs> well, those of you who know me know <laughs> my Quiet. Yeah, the one that I, I came as close to dying as possible was in Mount St. Helens, actually. And a little bit of background, I was on a cruise from Tahiti to Hawaii back to Corvallis uh, more than two months at that time in 1980. And as I was coming home from Hawaii to Corvallis on the boat, Mount St. Helens blew up. I was very upset that I wasn't there for that. I mean, you can't, I can't imagine how upset I was. But anyway, I got in about 10 days later or whatever, and the Forest Service contacted me and asked me if I would like to study lake recovery on Mount St. Helens. I said, oh yeah, absolutely, even though I knew nothing about lakes, but they didn't need to know that. <laughs> and, but that gave me an excuse to find, find a way to get into the crater. So this was like two weeks after the first explosion, and we were going into the lakes using helicopters, and at that time they were all uh, run by ex-Vietnam helicopter pilots. So I sort of got one to take me into the crater without getting approval. So he put on you know, my fireproof suit and a gas mask, and I wanted to get go into the dome and get some samples near a fumarole to see if there were any high temperature microbes there. And so this Vietnam pilot said, okay, we're, he hovered over the dome and I got out, he's still hovering. I, I want to point out, this was, the Richter scale in the, inside that crater was going around 50. I mean, I, you could hardly stand up. That's how much seismic activity was going on. So I go up into the, the dome and get a fumarole sample and hop right back into the, this is all done within a minute, hop into the chopper and as we get to the rim of the volcano, uh, the volcano it erupted the second time. So essentially 10 or 20 seconds more and we would have both been toast. So that's the first, that's the closest I've been to death. The helicopter pilot was so totally shook up. He went to the nearest place, landed and smoked 10 joints. And so that's how that, that's my closest near death experience. <laughs> That's not even the worst of it, Julia. I'm gonna shut up now. All right, um, Benu wants to know uh, more on the origin of lifelines. How similar are existing extremophiles to their ancestral versions? Hmm. Hmm. Well, you know, one of the things that you know that we try to do, we, we look at 
these global phylogenetic trees based on ribosomal RNA, and and we look at the deeply, the most deeply rooted groups of those organisms, and in, for the most part, they're organisms that grow at high temperature and in, and in the absence of oxygen, and many of them are the same organisms that are found, or similar organisms found at Yellowstone or at, or in hydrothermal vent environments. So it's what we call the top-down approach that uh, we can say, okay, if these are organisms that have metabolic systems that are very ancient, then we could get a better idea, for example, of what sort of setting they may have actually uh, first emerged in and uh, get a better idea of, of what to look for. So the top-down approach has done a lot of different things. It's, you know, looking at organisms themselves. It is, it's given us an idea of what maybe the most ancient metabolisms are, uh, in, in particularly energy metabolisms. And, and so, for example, many believe that organisms involved in, in uh, methane production, that pathway is ancient. There are others who think that Photosynthesis, the kind that is not, does not make oxygen but uses hydrogen or sulfur, uh, may date back as far as 3.8. And we just heard a seminar by Norm Sleep on last Tuesday uh, where he actually said that. He believes that the issue at 3.8 was an anoxygenic photosynthetic bacteria. So we, we, have, we, we take that approach, and once we have identified those kind of organisms, then we can say something about what is it they would, you know, require, what kind of environments would, uh, would they actually have uh, evolved in, etc. So the top-down approach is, I think, pretty important. I, I, we wouldn't have an RNA world without the top-down approach because we found in microorganisms RNAs that can be catalytic and act like enzymes and perhaps even partially replicate themselves. And that was the beginning of the RNA world. So. We learn from organisms about how to proceed in understanding the origin of life. Uh oh. Sanjoy wants to know when did you get interested in viruses and why are they important? Oh dear. I've been interested in viruses for a long, long time. Not as long as the origin of life, you know, where I wrote my first paper on the origin of life in grade school and had nuns that contacted my parents saying that I was not in going in the right direction. So I won't go into that. Uh, but let me see. Viruses, as an undergraduate in microbiology, I was extremely fascinated by microbial genetics uh, and virology, but microbial genetics. And at that time, uh, you know, one of the mechanisms for horizontal gene transfer you know, genes going from one organism to the other is, was from viruses and bacteria. But essentially it was all being done with one organism, Escherichia coli. Uh, and there were seven key viruses plus a, a, what we call a transducing virus, Lambda, that was very much involved in gene transfer. So I was playing around with this kind of stuff and taking these courses and wondering is, I mean, it, this has to be more significant than just a genetic tool. I mean, does this occur in the environment? And nobody was doing this kind of work. So when I got to my PhD, I, my professor said, well, you know, I'll, I'm willing to go with this provided you can get some funds. So I wrote a proposal uh, to NSF and got funding to do that kind of work, to look for a a system in which the viruses can transmit genes in the natural environment, mainly the marine environment. So that was my PhD thesis. I was just extremely interested in that. And I did find, I found a group of microbes and a group of viruses and found that horizontal gene transfer was occurring in the guts of oysters. And so, uh, so I, my thesis was on oysters as a conjugal bed for horizontal gene transfer using viruses. I tried to name my thesis uh, after Henry Miller's series of books, Sexus, Plexus, Nexus, and Marine Vibrios, but my committee wouldn't let me do that. 
Oh. <laughs> um, all right. Oh, my goodness. Um, hang on. All right. Uh, Banu says, isn't the ecosystem underwater, I think she means hydrothermal vents, very impermanent? How would life establish and then become stable there? Well, it, it's, it's very, it's a dynamic system, and it probably, uh, as I said, it never really, hydrothermal systems never really go away, it's just their surface expression shifts. And so you have in the, in the subsurface, particularly, you know, where uh, plates are separating particularly rapidly, you, you have a lot of dynamic activity going on in there. So uh, there's a group of students and postdocs here from the University of Washington, Sanjoy and Rika and Billy were part of that, that wrote a paper uh, that it, it, that's basically titled that you needed a whole global uh, earth in order to established all the conditions necessary for the origin of life. And part of that is a sort of dynamic movement of, you know, through cracks, uh, water moving through the subsurface, etc., so that a condition that might be favorable to, to producing one aspect of the origin of life, like a certain group of organic compounds or a key catalyst, the products of that could move on to another set of conditions and, and become more and more complex. So I, I, I think that was a model that you do need a, a global earth in order to actually have an origin of life. I'm not a big firm believer that life started, like I said in my early papers, at just one site. I think that early life, the first life form, started under fairly narrow sets of conditions and potentially that could be certain kinds of hydrothermal conditions, but you needed a lot more than hydrothermal vents to uh, make all the components necessary in order to establish life. I will make the point that I am a firm believer in the search for exoplanets that may have life that I think one of the key characteristics is a tectonically active uh, planet with water. I, I, I don't think you can have a de novo origin of life without a tectonically active planet with water talked about that with my students. Um, and then Julia says to add to that question, could you talk more about how quickly life, both micro and macro, establishes at new vent sites? It's, it's an interesting question because I, I think in, in the microbial stuff, they're all, I mean, everything is contaminated. It's already there. Uh, but when animals have become extinct, uh, either because of a new eruption such as at East Pacific Rise, uh, they found larvae moving in fairly rapidly, uh, including larvae that were normally not found in vents. And so they established early, but then were superseded by the, the natural larvae that came in. So within a year, you actually started seeing uh, animals coming back into those kind of environments. No matter what happens in, in in, in the surface expression of hydrothermal vents, the microbes involved in hydrothermal vents are probably ubiquitous in the subsurface. You know, the extrusive layer of the crust, about 300 meters, has about a 20 or 30 percent porosity. It holds 2 percent of the ocean seawater at any one time. So it's highly, highly contaminated with microbes of all kinds. All right, geez, we're getting a lot. All right, uh, Billy says, I have four students watching with me. One of them asks, what do you think about the lightning and organic soup idea of the origin of life? Billy, you put them on to that? <laughs> Probably. Uh, yes. Uh, well, you know, it's, I think, you know, Stanley Miller back in the 1950s when he published that first paper that, you know, uh, lightning discharge making amino acids was a huge major paper, uh, even though the atmospheric conditions that they started out with are now thought to be wrong. Um, but it was a, it was a very important paper. Um, Miller's group now uh, are doing two things, interestingly enough. 
is they're still keeping lightning involved, but they're going into volcanoes. So a lot of terrestrial volcanoes also, as a result of volcanism, produce lightning. And the last talks I've heard by that group blend those two things together. Um, certainly, you know, lightning discharge with the right kinds of chemistry can produce organic compounds, including amino acids, etc. But there are several other ways to do to make amino acids also, and uh, so lightning discharge may have actually contributed to uh, you know the formation of amino acids that may have actually been involved in the origin of life. But certainly, uh, the concept of a soup with lightning bombarding that soup with a bazillion organic compounds, and suddenly God's hand going into the soup and making life is not going to happen. So I think you need something much more complex than that. But lightning's cool. <laughs> lightning is cool. <laughs> Make sure any. <laughs> Billy said no. That was a real question. All right. Um, let's see here. We have a couple more. Um, do you have any thoughts about applied astrobiology, especially as we move into a future where climate change becomes more pronounced? Oh, that's a good. That's a good question. Uh, yes, actually. Uh, Maybe the only way we could actually teach people about the role of climate change and how it can affect life and ecosystems is to find other planetary bodies who have actually undergone the climate change that uh, essentially uh, annihilated a potential ecosystem. So it's not just a place like Venus that might actually early on uh, may have had conditions that would have been conducive to life or even an origin of life, but because of massive greenhouse and uh, sulfur emissions is no longer capable of supporting life. So I think one of the beauties of astrobiology at a lot of different levels is the n equals 2 on a lot of things, not just n equals 2 for another group of organisms or another origin of life, but a way in which we can actually see the future of Earth uh, if the atmosphere is or conditions are disturbed enough to actually uh, uh, affect uh, ecosystems and, and life. So I think looking for looking at an en uh, an exoplanet that might actually be what an Earth might look like ten thousand years from now if we continue doing what we're doing, you know. Uh, yeah. All right. This question has multiple parts. Okay. Grasshopper starts with, hi, John. I have a question regarding planetary protection. A Dutch reality television series called Mars One plans to land humans on Mars funded by advertising revenue. At first, hearing about this, I envisioned an MTV real-world scenario where the stars might contaminate the surface with their shenanigans. Considering this, what role do you think planetary protection should play in this new era of privatized space exploration? And do you think that our planetary protection policies of the past have slowed down manned exploration in exchange for the hope of discovering life using rovers to preclude contamination? Somebody points out that fortunately Mars One has neither the resources nor technological, technological expertise to launch anything to Mars, but says... The larger question is a go run. How do we balance planetary protection requirements against human missions? A mouthful. <laughs> That's a good question. And uh, sending a human or humans to Mars is certainly going to have a forward contamination issue that's going to be. Uh, really difficult to surmount. Uh, but I do think that if sending a human to Mars was a reality, uh, it's the kind of mission that would have a huge positive effect on, I think, the world overall, uh, to, uh, to send a, the human uh, to the Mar uh, to, to Mars would would really be a, a, a you know a profound statement. Planetary protection issues would make it extremely difficult uh, to do that. Uh, I think you know we're looking at going back to the moon where there's no doesn't seem to be any issues or uh, 
but Mars is going to be real difficult. I was just, I came off just last year a Mars planetary protection uh, program uh, sponsored by the European Science Foundation. It also had Coast Bar people, including uh, people from the U.S. on the committee, and it was about bringing a sample back from Mars. And it's going to cost more to bring that sample back by a factor of three or four than just to get there and get the sample, uh, to contain it, to make sure it doesn't uh, uh, break down at any point during uh, return to Earth, etc. So getting a human onto Mars is going to be extremely interesting if, if that ever was to come about. Uh, I mean, I'd like to see it. I, I do think that we're a little, get a little carried away sometimes in planetary protection issues. Uh, and it has prevented, I think, a lot of, I think, some really good science from happening. Uh, but I won't go into that right now. Interesting. All right, we're nearing the end here. Um, I think Sandra had one up here that I didn't want to skip. Oh, yeah. Any words of wisdom for upcoming astrobiology students? Well, I think, you know, all of you who are astrobiology people that, you know, that are finished have lots of words of wisdom for astrobiology students. I think my, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in a couple of things. One is the importance of discovery, and I think astrobiology offers uh, multiple opportunities for making scientific and, and other discoveries. Uh, I think that is one of the highest motivations that we can have as a, as a human race, is to continue to make discoveries and explore. So, I mean, my it's not like I have any advice or wisdom, uh, only that you can gain a great deal of joy from the insight of doing something that no one else has done and trying to make a discovery. And then using that as a way to convey your excitement to a broader audience to make this whole process continue, uh, to give a sense of, I, I think, a, a, a kind of a meaning to other students to say, here's an opportunity to explore, here's an opportunity to make a discovery, here's an opportunity to uh, change the way people think about uh, you know, science, and particularly about science in space. Um, and actually along those lines, what are the next big questions you feel that the upcoming generation of astrobiologists should tackle from Grasshopper? Oh, well, uh, I mean, I, <laughs> why are you asking that, Grasshopper? <laughs> An easy if question. I were a grasshopper, I'd hop right out of here right now. <laughs> no, <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I think that right now, where most of the really potentially exciting stuff is being done, is in the search for an Earth-like exoplanet, and I think we need to be prepared at this point to know what to do if, and I think it's going to be rather than if, when, we find a, an exosolar Earth-like planet around an Earth-like Sun with an Earth-like Jupiter. So we're going to basically find a very similar solar system. Uh, how, what are the next things we would do? If, if we find something like that, then everything is going to focus on that Earth-like planet. What do we do? What's the focus? What new technology has to be developed? Uh, what do we want to find? How do, how, how do we measure it, etc.? And I, I think there's so much room for development of not only technology, but of new models and new hypotheses on how to uh, go about understanding that. All right. And I think we had one, <laughs> Sanjoy says, are there any books you recommend? <laughs> so that's the last one we have on here right now. Uh, on what subjects, though, enjoy? <laughs> <laughs> I think we were talking about this recently. Hey, Sanjoy, what topic? 
He's got thousands of books in his office. Astrobiology, he says. <laughs> Another easy question. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not like there is any one book that is interesting. It's, I think what's important is to get into them. And I'm a big fan of, of for example, the late Bob Shapiro's uh, book, basically dealing with the origin of life. I think that is a spectacular book uh, in dealing with astrobiology and the origin of life for a couple of reasons. One is he really identifies where the issues are and, and discusses them. Uh, I also like the, the fine gold uh, Shapiro book dealing with uh, essentially broadening the definition of life to include uh, uh, a, a biospheric definition, for example. I think it's a, it's a good thought-provoking uh, type book that I, I definitely like. Um, there's a bunch of others that, you know, that are really worth reading. Uh, and you know, in astrobiology, uh, you know, if you're interested in more of the historical stuff around that, some uh, one of Freeman Dyson's book is is an interesting read. Uh, if you're interested in origin stuff and some of the implications, uh, Christian Dedue's book on vital dust is still an eminently good readable book, and I really highly recommend his last chapter. I really like it a lot. Uh, so, I should jump in here, and I think Sanjoy may be referring to the time that at lab meeting, John decided that we weren't well read enough, and so one day he sat down and took out a huge box that he'd ordered from Amazon and gave us all three books each because we hadn't read these particular books that he considered essential. And I think they were, they were the procedure. I forget the author of that one. They were um, one by periodic table. The periodic table what? by Primo Levi. Right? Uh, Sean, uh, uh, Levy, uh, Primo Levi. Yeah, and then there was. And then uh, Herman Hesse's Narcissus and Goldman. Narcissus and Goldman, and the last one. And the last Sinclair one Lewis. was on. Aerosmith. Aerosmith. Aerosmith by Sinclair Lewis. <laughs> there we go. Everyone, Billy and Sanjoy are chiming in. These were books that we still all have that John just gave to us one day at lab meeting. So. All right, I think that is all the questions we have here. Sanjoy says, let's all thank John for joining us on Sagan Net. And, um... Well, thanks for joining me. It's a pleasure to, to talk to all of you, and, I, I'm, and uh, I wish I could actually see your, see your faces and check out your smile again. But anyway, have a <laughs> great Thanksgiving, and, and uh, it was fun. <laughs> all right. Thanks, guys. We're signing off.